All right, here we go. Well, my name is Ray Fearing. I'm the Educational Technology Coordinator with Del Norte County Office of Education and Del Norte County Unified School District. We're in California. And I wanted to host uh, a hangout on air so we could discuss all of the things we've been doing since our code in December and the science education. And also, I wanted to talk with others about how that went, what kind of our code events you had, and what are our plans from here? What are we going to do to continue coding with our kids? So um, we may have people coming during the hangout, but for currently, it's just uh, the two of us, myself and Sam Patterson. So Sam, we want to introduce yourself. Yes, I'm Sam Patterson. I am the kindergarten through fifth grade technology integration specialist at Hausner School, a small private school in the Bay Area. Great. Thank you so much for, for coming today and taking the time to do this. Oh, definitely. It's uh, Hour of Code was really an amazing experience for me and kind of a transformative moment for our campus. So I'm pretty excited to talk about it. Excellent. So let's start there. Um, why don't you tell me a little bit about the Hour of Code event that you did in December. Give us a synopsis of what events happened and how that went. Sure. We, um, when we heard about the Hour of Code, we looked at a couple different ways to, you know, how could we use this, what could we do with it, and while we've been doing a lot of coding with every grade level, uh, we decided that Hour of Code would be a wonderful opportunity to kind of have a family event. And we actually opted for a two-hour Sunday event. And we are a kindergarten through eighth grade school, so we wanted to make sure that we had workshops available for kindergarten through eighth grade. And we actually put out a call for volunteers and had over 30 parents respond that they wanted to help out volunteering one way or another. Um, in addition to this, there was a really strong response on campus from teachers who felt this was important and they wanted to help out. So what we ended up with was a mini conference with 14 sessions running concurrently and each session ran for half an hour. So we actually had a welcoming speaker. Uh, the two founders of the Codable app came to our campus and kind of gave an opening keynote and then we had three half hour sessions that followed that and we set it up so that there were three or four sessions running simultaneously that were accessible to each grade level. So there were some paper-based coding sessions using the Codable Fuzz Friends uh, paper-based coding as well as the cup stack stacking paper-based coding activity that Code.org supplied. Then we had, uh, we had workshops using the Codable app, we had workshops using the Lightbot Hour of Code, uh, the Lego Fix the Factory app, um, Hopscotch, there were several Hopscotch workshops. At the higher level we had uh, a JavaScript workshop, a Python workshop, uh, we had a Lego Robotics workshop, and there were a couple others, I don't have the, the list directly in front of me right now, but the idea was to make sure that we had something available for all skill and grade levels, and it was really well received. The the kind of aha moment as I was running around and all these sessions were happening simultaneously was you look into these rooms, and in the codable room particularly, because I was really geared, geared to the youngest students, we had kindergartners sitting next to their grandparents working on the same iPad. And um, one of the things that we chose to do when we set up the rooms, we set up each workshop for 24 participants, and we housed it with 12 iPads. So as many as of the workshops as possible were iPad-based, and we really approached it with a two-to-one um, philosophy because we wanted two people working together on the app. So it really wasn't about just teaching one person how to code. It was giving two people uh, a coding experience that gave them access to it. At the younger grades, because our students already had some exposure to these apps, it, that often took the shape of the student walking the parent or the grandparent through how to use this app and the coding thinking in that app. Um, so for us, it was really amazing. Prior to this, we had struggled as a school to be kind of more tech visible and had been challenged by a number of the parents on our campus to do more with computer programming and uh, computational thinking. And part of this comes from where we are, the fact that we're in Silicon Valley and we do have a lot of computer connected parents. And part of it just comes from what parents want from a school. 
these days. This is an important skill, and and people want to see that there's their students are learning it. Uh, so this was great because it gave us kind of an opportunity to do a tech open house, as well as to get the community involved in computer science education on our campus. So at the end of the day, we had over 200 people show up to this uh, program. And at the end of the day, I've got a list of all of the computer science eager, helpful parents on my campus. So as a tech integration specialist, now I actually have like a, a short list of who to call for help if I want to do something else with that I don't know how to do. Nice. Well, that sounds excellent. And uh, one of the benefits I think you have of being in a urban area or an area with lots of resources in the Bay Area, you have access to um, like the codable people need there and some other needs. things. We are very rural and did not have access to um, people like that willing to come by, but uh, we're about uh, seven hours north of San Francisco, right on the right. Northern California border. Um, what we did was um, to get teachers ready for this, but the idea of coding was very new to a lot of teachers. I held some teacher preview sessions where I brought teachers in who wanted to code with their students and we did some hour of code ourselves. So we had the teachers do the hour of code on their own, just learning by themselves. And they were really excited by that. And most of them, I think all of them, went back to their classrooms and did it with their students. I was able to go to about three or four classrooms and help you know, co code with the kids and the teacher, which was great. All in all, we had over 700 kids participate in Hour of Code that week. We had one middle school, well, it's a K-8 school, who had every student in school go through an Hour of Code. They used their iPad, their lab, and they rotated every kid through. So every student on that campus got to do one Hour of Code. And um, that was really, really cool. And the kids loved it. The comments I've gotten from teachers watching students code has been amazing. They're seeing kids. Know, get up and turn and um, figure out how to move the characters that they need to move. Just that physicalness of, of the doing the critical thinking, but the physical part as well. So we had quite a few hour of code events. We're still trying to get some other kids doing an hour of code. We'll continue that on. But that week, um, about so we're really excited to get that many. We were a school district of about 3,800 or so. So that was a, a large percentage of our kids coded. Yeah, and that's one of the things that's really been impressive to me was how the infrastructure that was kind of crowdsourced for Hour of Code, you know, I think Code.org did an amazing job kind of leading the way and setting up these tutorials and getting other, you know, people to make these tutorials. Um, they really made this accessible on such a large scale. So, I mean, any situation where you can get 700 students you know, going through and doing an hour of code in a week is is amazing. Just not even thinking about the logistical issue of getting 700 students to do anything inside of, you know, a set curriculum because we all have those curricular goals. And when I was reading through the uh, code.org materials, it was talking about, you know, getting every teacher to teach an hour of code. And I thought, wow, I just started this position as tech integration specialist. I'm not necessarily sure that I want to tell my teachers what they have to do. But I think that, you know, what you did by setting up a hour of code preview for the teachers to give them access to it, to allow them to see it, that's the kind of thing you need to do to get teachers to buy into something they're not familiar with and to get them to ded dedicate an hour of class time. They really need to see the value in it before they're going to be willing to give up that time. Absolutely. And I think they did, like you said, bringing them in to see it ahead of time. They were like, this is useful, this is important. And then, of course, afterwards they're like, we need to keep going. Um, Let's talk for just a minute about why coding is important. So give me your take on why why we need kids coding. Well, when I, for, for a couple of years as an English teacher, I've always struggled, well, for my whole teaching career in English, I've struggled with teaching grammar. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that native speakers don't really need to pay much attention to syntax. So even on a removed very far from computer science education, teaching students to code and teaching them about the syntax of a programming language is a skill that is that transfers to other subject areas uh, more than I think we talk about in general. You don't hear many people talking about a connection between English grammar and computer coding. But once you set up the schema that 
a programming language gives specific directions to the recipient and this is just another mode of communication and they've worked with that and they've seen how errors in syntax can result in errors in understanding. You can build a bridge with that back to you need to revise this paper again because it doesn't yet make sense. Um, but above and beyond that there's a lot of logic in syntax. It's essentially built on logic and we don't have as many opportunities to talk about that discreetly in curriculum as we would like. We may do it when we're introducing rhetoric or something like that at the high school level, but really when students can understand how a language functions and the different ways that you can manipulate it to make it function, I think they end up being really empowered we were uh, lucky enough to have um, Ari Pittori, the one of the founders of Code.org, actually come to our school and speak. And he was talking about the Angry Birds tutorial. And in the Angry Birds tutorial, you can go... You have to make the uh, avatar turn left. So he was problem solving with the kids. If you can only turn right, how do you turn left? And they eventually came up with, oh, and he's talking to kindergartners here. They came up with the fact that you you know turn right three times, and that'll get you facing left. And so just that whole, if you have a limited number of commands, how do you make the most of it? And then how do you make that more efficient? So those types of computational thinking are really kind of empowering. I mean, the idea of setting up a repeat loop or a function, those are things that our students aren't going to intersect until they're asked to do something like this. But using the, the Codable app, I've actually seen kindergartners figure out how functions work, which means that these five-year-olds understand the concept of a variable. Now, as an instructor, I'm kind of wait a minute, we teach algebra at like, what, fifth, sixth grade? And here we have variables in kindergarten, and it works, and they understand it because they're using it. So there's just a lot of logic and computational thinking that can go into many other parts of the curriculum. But with this kind of high engagement activity, it's a lesson that they're able to learn and really internalize quite quickly. So you end up with a great kind of confluence of the incredibly engaging format and the foundational uh, skills that you want them to learn. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, great connection to language arts because a lot of teachers have asked me, we want to do coding, we think it's important, but how can I teach this in an English class? Why would it be relevant to what I'm doing in, in my subject area? And you made a great connection there that that clarity of communication is so critical and this teaches it very, very clearly. I sat with third graders and we were doing um, Lightbot app, and they were like, well, you know, he just needs to go forward. And, and they were skipping the turn before going forward. And so watching them process that what I'm telling the little robot to do uh, is not doing what I want, and I would always explain, remember, they only do exactly what you tell them to do. And so if we have to be clear in our communication, I love, I love that point that you made. Um, oh, and I love having that, you know, objective robot on the other end of it, because teaching writing, you're always intersecting a lot with ego, and they think if you don't like their writing or it doesn't make, they think that if you have a critique of their writing, that means you don't like their writing, and that means you don't like them, when really you're saying this doesn't yet make sense. So instead of having me sit there and go, no, this isn't quite right yet, which seems subjective, you've got, well, the, the robot's not doing the right thing yet. You don't have it yet. Right, right, excellent. And as a science teacher, a former science teacher, always struggling to get kids to work through to the end product, to persevere, to have that grit to get through a task. And I really saw kids persevering, get sticking it out. They wanted to reach that next level. They wanted to achieve the goal. They wanted to go get the um, zombie or whatever it was. And they persevered and figured it out because they could keep trying. And, and you know, with support in the room, that really motivated them to, to try it again and figure it out. And I loved it when I saw kids who normally would give up, keep trying, and then eventually go, I got it. And the, the enjoyment they were getting, the pride they felt in their accomplishments was just awesome to see. Right. And it's, it's funny that when you went, I got it, you've got that little fist pump, right? I saw more fist pumps in class during Hour of Code 
than than ever before, right? So that's you know as as the educator, I am always skeptical of everything I put you know go to put in front of my kids, looking for you know is this the best thing? Is this a good use of time? Is this hitting my learning goals? And the engagement that the kids feel in these tutorials and in these kind of gamified approaches is amazing because it does support them to persevere, to be resilient. Um, and from like a social emotional level, it was great working with kids where you put two of them on an iPad and they have to co-problem solve. Or you tell them as they were as the younger kids, you know, K through three were getting more adept with it. After the first lesson I put them one to one on the iPads, but I said, now if you have a question, you have to ask the person sitting next to you before you ask me. You know, and there were some kids who the first moment where they're stuck, they raise a hand and they wait for an adult to come help them, and there's others that dig further into it, and there's others that will say, oh, you're, you're stuck there, try this, this, and this. Yeah. Um, but even with the younger kids, that whole, we had discussions about when you want to help somebody but you don't want to take over, how do you help them? Right? Because the first thing they want to do is jump over their shoulder and start touching the screen, and just getting them to navigate that um, was amazing. So so many of the goals, like the tech integration goals, overlap with the social and emotional learning goals, and having a high engagement platform really, you know, up to the the ante of this because all of the kids wanted to be involved, but they had to negotiate that space with each other, otherwise they would end up losing the opportunity to do that. Yeah, you know, one other thing I wanted to point out about the hour of code week was we had we don't have a ton of tech like a lot of schools, it's not like we're one-to-one -one everywhere. Um, and some teachers just have their computer or one iPad in the room. And what was great is we had a third grade teacher do the um, Hour of Code, one of the tutorials with her student whole class. And what they did is she would do it on her iPad and project it, and then the kids on their whiteboard, she would go, okay, what would be the next direction? And they would all write down what they think the next code would be and hold it up. And then as a class, they would talk about that, they would try it and then see the outcome and which direction the avatar moves. So um, she had kids standing up and moving, and, and she really enjoyed That's just one iPad or off of your computer for the computer-based tutorials. But still, all the kids were thinking. They were all participating. And of course, as you know, I've never seen engagement so high as during when they're doing so, Yeah, and I love the, uh, the idea of using the whiteboards to have the kids you know, essentially write the next line of code to keep them invested and keep them participating. Um, we had two different, uh, we ran both paper-based coding activities that I could find, and I'm still using them. Like yesterday, I was using the cup stacking coding activity with my fourth and fifth graders, and there's a really wide range of experience. I've got some fourth graders who have coded with Python already. I've got some that are in the Lego Robotics Club, and I have others that have done no computer coding at all. Um, so that paper-based coding activity of cup stacking was really perfect because they had to write the directions and they were using those those physical artifacts to kind of set it up and come to understand it. Um, so that was great and it allowed us to create more opportunities for participation because we had, you know, at some point we ran out of devices and we're like, well, you know, we have many people that have responded to this. How do we set up more uh, opportunities. Right. So let's talk a little bit then about about that and how we've continued to support coding in the classroom. What um, other events have spawned from your district's participation, your school's participation in the Hour of Code, and what other things are happening um, beyond that? Well, we uh, before Hour of Code, we really had a clear policy that we were trying to get computer programming into every grade level. Um, and by the time we hit Hour of Code, we had almost gotten to that point. And going through the process of developing those Hour of Code tutorials really helped us see where we can take kind of the top end of our programming. Because the challenge is getting all students to do some level of advanced programming, but also supporting those students who are just willing to go above and beyond um, and are really interested in it and finding a way to, to keep that involved in their academic life because otherwise they're just going to go to a coding club somewhere else after school and we're not really going to have access to what they're doing there. So we really want to keep that in the community. Um, 
And we've got a project where the sixth grade does some HTML. The seventh grade engineering class does uh, some visual basic inside of Excel and uh, also uses Game Star Mechanic to do some game design thinking. But the eighth grade, we were really struggling with what we were going to do there, what language it would be. So now we know that it's going to be Python, but we're still struggling with, you know, what is that going to look like? Where are we going to fit that in? Is that in tech class? Is that part of a STEM elective? And how can we support our teachers to be able to implement that? Because while we can say gung-ho, yes, Python's definitely the right one to go, we don't necessarily have a teacher here that's all Pythoned up and ready to be, you know, a super leader in Python. And while the teachers were very comfortable with the Hour of Code tutorials, I know that, you know, there's definitely some anxiety of going beyond that to, well, well, I don't know, you know, they have a problem and they need to solve it. I don't know how to solve that. And even if I can give them resources, I think one of the challenges is going beyond Hour of Code, at what level do you need genuine expertise and how do you cultivate that in your community? Yeah, and that, that's the key right there because we've got other events planned to kind of continue our co-type events. And I'm doing a third grade class and a fifth grade class um, a coding project. It's a month long, four or five week long project where we go in weekly with iPads because they don't have iPads in the room. So I come in and teach with the teacher and we let kids work on projects over time and develop uh, games and projects using Hopscotch. And so that's one way to continue it and let them get a little more coding and game development. And um, but beyond that, how do I start, like you say, these, these ongoing upper level things like an after school coding group or getting it into a class? We don't have any real classes coding. Um, we do have a tech teacher at a middle school and a high school who are doing some coding during their other curriculum. Um, they're putting in some coding there, but um, we need to find ways in our district to get coding. Over more uh, embedded so that kids get these skills coming up. We had a student who graduated from one of our schools here contacted us, happened to arrange it all during computer science education week. He's an engineer now, and I forget with what company, one of the big computer companies, and he wanted to give back to the district. So he talked to our high school and said, listen, I will come be a hangout and be in the room and help your kids learn Python and coding. Because when I wanted to be a programmer and got out of high school and went to college, I was so far behind the other programmers who've been doing it for years and years and years. And so we need to get kids thinking about it young so that then if they do want to pursue it, they are not starting from scratch as 18, 19, 20 year olds. They will have that background to, to boost them um, that way if they want to go. So he spent many days coaching that class and teaching those kids Python. I went in there and watched what they were doing way over my head, um, but it was it was awesome to see, and they were very, very good at explaining to me what they were doing. They were so involved in it, and these are not all future programmers, but they were learning a really good skill, doing some really hard work, and making some incredible things happen. Yeah, and I think a, a situation like that is really great, because you've got someone who's got an investment in the community, as well as the activity, who's, you know, really motivated. And um, I know that we've talked, we're actually going to, starting in the spring, we're going to have a kindergarten through third grade after school coding club that meets once a week to kind of go deeper into that. And we've talked about, there were several of the upper school kids who after our code were like, oh, we need to do this more. And basically what they've said to us and have challenged us to say, give us opportunities to have time and space to teach each other coding. I've got three or four kids that will take over the computer lab at any point and be like teaching each other Java, which is really cool. Yeah. But at the same time, it's really difficult because we are a school that uses all of our space almost all of the time, right? Our learning specialists are always looking for places to meet because they don't have enough little rooms to meet with kids. So even coming up with a spot where kids can work in the computer lab during lunch or something is challenging. And then there's some culture issues. Like there's a lot of concern about the amount of kids' time spent, the amount of screen time kids have. So several years ago, when we started making this technology push, there was this, okay, during lunch is going to be a screen-free time where we get them to socialize with each other and hang out with each other and play with each other, which is 
phenomenal. I am not arguing against play. But at the same time, if we have a bunch of kids who say, wow, we really want to co-code with each other and want to teach each other code, can we do that during lunch? You know, that that's something where the tech committee has to meet again and say, are we making best use of our time? Is this policy still appropriate? Right, right. Because it is social when they're collaborating together and learning to do those types of things. Right. You know, there there's not... It's a kind of policy that was set with kind of a ideological di dichotomy between screen time and social time. And, you know, that, that dissolves more and more, it seems. It does. It does seem to. And I, I think part of it is breaking through the stigma of every time a kid's on a screen or an iPad or a computer, that they are wasting time or doing meaningless um, gaming or something like that. That a lot of that screen time can be very social, um, very educational, and build skills that they need. So it's not always just kind of that you know, zoning out time. It can be very useful to their thinking, their processing, their education. So, and I think balance is, is always important. You know, we don't want kids glued to us when we're going to get. Um, Right, you know, there there are times where screen time is not the best thing. But at the same time, you know, that argument against screen time sounds a lot like what my dad used to say when he found me reading. You know, like, like why don't you go do something? And I'm sitting here, I'm three-quarters of the way through this book. I am doing something. Um, but we just had very different expectations for, for what something meant and what it meant to do, I guess. Um, but, it, it, yeah, trying to find that balance. And really, you know, we want our students to be well-informed, empowered digital citizens. And what that means changes a lot. It does. It does, yes. Um, some other things I wanted to throw out here from Code.org about what to do now after the Hour of Code event. Uh, they are encouraging people to tell Congress that you support the Computer Science Education Act, uh, giving students in the U.S. access to computer science in schools. So that's something to keep in mind if you want to uh, take it to the next level. Also, keep learning for yourself and your child. Um, and I love your idea of getting the parents involved because now they can go home with their kids, grandparents and kids, or parents and kids, and continue coding together and learning together. Um, I became a Google certified teacher this summer, and some of us started to do a, a JavaScript class online, and we would meet and talk together to learn, to learn Java. And that was very helpful, and so I'm trying to continue with that and improve my skills. Um, so even as adults, it's always good to, to learn a little more and, and do those things that are available. And there's tons available online. Well, and I think a really important uh, piece of what you just said is that while you were learning, you got involved in this other community, and this other community that you got involved in enabled your learning. It ends up being a really reciprocal relationship. Um, and one of my challenges, I mean, as I started teaching coding to kids, it was like, okay, so one of the things you really have to teach them is where the resources are and how to interact with those resources. And nine times out of ten, those resources are people more than just static libraries of code. Um, and interacting with people to learn requires, you know, attending so much of their needs as well as, you know, getting what you need out of the situation. It was. And when I got stuck on, I think it was conditionals, um, it was those... Google certified teacher friends of mine that I would go to and say, ah, oh, what's wrong with my coding here? And they would find a mistake or help me get through that. And so having those those people to talk to also, they're important resources. Definitely. So let's talk a little bit about um, how we can support each other in the future, keep kids coding and keep coding programs going in our, our schools. So I'm hoping and that I can reach out to you about your parent. I, I'm loving that idea, and I really want to do some things with, with parents and students and some after-school type activities. I'm hoping that you would be a resource for me. What other things might we be able to offer or point people to that get support? Well, I think that one of the best ways we can support each other as teachers is by writing and sharing about what we're doing regardless of the level of success, which kind of takes a, definitely a, a certain amount of bravery to reflect publicly on what you're doing and to share that information with other teachers. Um, but And also develop the resources that we need as much as we can. When we were doing Hour of Code, I looked at all of the available uh, tutorials as well as what I had on my site and we have about 12 Lego NXT robots and 
being able to use those in Hour of Code was great because they were physical manipulatives and the robots actually do something and it kind of got it out of the computer. But at the same time, there wasn't, you know, a Lego NXT Robotics Hour of Code tutorial. So I had to develop that. And as I developed it, I did it with an eye towards, okay, how can I make this useful to other teachers also? And I kind of built it into a blog post and shared it out that way. And I know some other teachers have already used that. Um, I'm not saying that that tutorial is the best tutorial for NXT ever, but I needed to put together a tutorial for NXT LEGO Robotics programming, and it needed to be about an hour, and I did that, and I shared it, and I've gotten some feedback from that. So that's, I think, the kind of thing that we have to challenge each other to do, and we have to challenge our school administrations to make that level of sharing not only okay, but to really encourage that level of sharing. Because as school leaders, if we set up policies and infrastructure that makes it easy and rewarding for teachers to share with our parents and with our students and with other teachers, um, we're actually creating a, a fertile bed to build community, not only within our school area, but kind of allow our teachers to engage in a wider global community of education. I agree, and that's critical. I mean, we all know we're all better together, and encouraging teachers to share, which is scary at first, um, I know, but I've, I've been blogging about a year or so now, and, you know, I share what I do, and it may be at a much lower level than other people, but that's okay, because that's where I'm at, and always there are people that read my blog and comment and say, hey, I want to do that. They're not even at my level, and so I'm helpful to right. them, and then I read other blogs that are above me, and I'm like, okay, I want to get to that. And I have this, this resource and sharing one also, it really helps me reflect on what I did. Mm -hmm. I blog for myself and I hope it helps others. And I really find that the discipline is sitting down and I don't have huge expectations. I try to blog about what I'm doing about once or twice a month. Or is great. Once a month is okay. I try to at least once a month blog. And then I am much better at reflecting and moving forward and thinking about what I'm doing. And I always get great from that. So I've got people who talk to me about what I've done and, um, and then offer me suggestions and also help me. So it's been a great process and I agree with you that we've got to get it okay for teachers to share and that no matter what stage of learning you're at, it's valuable for other people. Not right. I, I think so many teachers feel like in order to share what they're doing they need to be an expert. And in a lot of ways they are. They may not feel that way. But, you know, with the amount of time we spend on our craft, the amount of time we spend developing curriculum, responding to students, and just being present in that educational moment, we're always gathering information. We're always making decisions. And taking a break now and then and writing about the thinking you're doing can really help kind of preserve it as well as push it further. There are many times where I say, you know, I've been, you know, working on this, this, and this, and I need to blog about it. And when I actually blog about it, I'll come away from it understanding what I'm doing more because writing is a very formalized way of thinking about what you're doing. Even if you just start off with, you know, my goal was this, the experience was this, the lesson learned was this, it doesn't have to be anything too complex. Throw a picture or two in there, um, and it allows other teachers to kind of see what you're doing and gives them a way, it's an invitation for interaction. It's an invitation to a discussion. I've found that because I blog, I end up in a lot more conversations with teachers because when I start a conversation and they're like, who is this guy? They can look me up and they can look at my blog and they're like, oh, this is a guy who writes about this, this, and this. And, you know, if, if I've written it correctly, he seems to be, you know, nice and accessible and somewhat intelligent, wonderful. Too bad he makes so many spelling errors, or whatever it is, you know, um, because blogs don't have to be perfect. The work that I do in my classroom doesn't have to be perfect. I, uh, you know, when I make videos for my class, I try not to get hung up on having it be perfect because I know that I will never share something if I want it to be perfect before I send it out and share it. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, I read a blog post this morning by David Terrio, an awesome educator in California. Love David. Yes, and a Google certified teacher, he was in Chicago with me, and um, he mentioned in his blog post, you can find him on Twitter, and I read it also, but he talked about the fact that um, this idea of greatness, 
like you said, teachers are afraid if I'm not great at it, if I'm not perfect, I shouldn't be posting or sharing. And his you know, take is that you don't have to be great. Um, every kid's not going to have a great teacher, but they deserve to have a teacher who's trying to be great. We're all not all going to be the great ones, um, but we need to be trying, and every kid deserves that in a teacher, someone who's always working to do their best, working together, collaborating, and trying to be as great as they can. And I think I think sharing is key to that. So. I, I, and that's a great point. Definitely, and, and that kind of idea speaks very loudly to how we serve as models for our students on so many levels, right? I want my students to be empowered learners who are connecting with as much of the world as possible, and the way that I can support them in that is by making sure that I am myself an empowered learner, that I am reaching out trying to connect with the world, that I am sharing the work that I'm doing. When I ask my students to blog and they find my blog posts, they're like, wow, okay, so you actually blog. This is something you really do. Um, and the fact that I blog when my students do work that they're comfortable with sharing publicly, I have an audience that I can bring to them. Um, and that's really empowering. What we're doing right now, today in seventh grade, we've been doing a um, game design lesson using the website GameStar Mechanic where they can actually build video games. And the last step to that was take that video game and embed it in a blog post and share it with your classmates, play their game, and respond to it on the blog. So we're really like getting them to engage in that social protocol, getting them to try these different things, and to be familiar with how you share the work that you do digitally. Because when I was in a conversation recently with a school leader, and we were talking about the the advantages and disadvantages to digital media and I was talking about how sharing is your superpower. We can share student work like never before and that can really change our school community from keeping parents much more involved in what we're doing in the classroom to bringing other teachers in to connecting with classrooms across the country across the world. Um, when we set this up so that we're sharing our work and that work doesn't have to be perfect, we're not sharing only best practices, we're sharing our struggles, we're sharing our process, um, it really makes it a much bigger conversation and can be transformative for students who will often feel isolated um, because they're just having this experience in this classroom, just as teachers who don't have enough opportunities to talk to other teachers can feel isolated. Absolutely, and I, I think that's a key point also is it break, lets those kids have a voice. Might not ones who always raise their hand talking class, but they can collaborate on a much bigger level and share on a much larger scale through blogging and sharing their work that way. Uh, over the summer, I had an opportunity to work with a summer program, and we it was grade it was basically middle school, I think fifth through eighth, and we had all of those students blogging, and they were blogging about what they were doing in the other classes in the summer school program. And I started sharing the blog posts, the learning reflections the students were writing with their content area teachers. And many of them were surprised because they're like, that student says nothing in class. And here in their blog post, they've got this great detailed reflection on their strawberry DNA extraction experiment. And I didn't even know they were that into it. Um, so, you know, really giving students different ways to express themselves, to share their work they're doing builds community and helps cut through assumptions that we as teachers can carry around when a student isn't saying anything, when they look disengaged, they could actually be thinking very deeply and just not comfortable with raising their hand in the room that they're in. Right, right, excellent. Well, um, let's do some uh, final thoughts and wrap up. I wanted to share one more story um, and it goes along the line with the sharing of our work. I was doing coding yesterday in fifth grade class it was week one of their hopscotch project. And so they were they had gone through the hopscotch tutorial and now they're starting to build their own programs. And literally within ten minutes, one student had created a game where there was a bear who had random movement on the screen. And then the cupcake who had to tap and tilt to keep it moving because if it collided with the bear, it would be eaten or disappear. He created this in ten minutes and then started passing it around the room. Well, first he wanted to show it on the Apple TV, so the airplane. Right. It. And then they all took turns playing this game he created in, in just a few minutes. And um, I'm starting to think now that I need to have him I need to make a video of that. We need to embed it in a blog and let him write about that experience. Definitely. 
and I, I hadn't thought about that. So maybe that will be something we work on as well, is getting a, more of a student voice from these projects rather than just me sharing what they're doing. Have you seen uh, Wes Fryer's Hopscotch Challenges book? Yes, I have. I downloaded it. It's really amazing. Did you watch the video embedded at the end where his student is talking about how to bring the emoji icons into Hopscotch? No, but... Um, it, was, it was so cool. And when you were talking about the student developing this and sharing their work, uh, you know, Wes literally shot the video over the kid's shoulder uh, to... It wasn't even like a full screen capture to really show how he was doing this. And when I showed my students that video, they were blown away on two different levels. One, that this was something you could do. Two, that a student had figured this out and had shared it. Um, so that was really amazing. Um, and, you know, West is definitely like a model digital citizen teacher, right? Because he, he put together this iBook, or I don't know if it's an iBook or just an eBook, I, but, you know, it's it was accessible to be on my PC, which was, that's what was important to me. It was a PDF or something. And, um, it allowed me as a teacher to significantly improve the lessons I was doing with Hopscotch and to even bring them down a couple grade levels because initially I was thinking, oh, well, Hopscotch will work great with fourth or fifth grade kids who are scratch ready. And on Friday, I'm taking it into second grade and we're going to teach angle measures in second grade using Hopscotch. And they don't teach like polygon angle measures in second grade at all because protractors are hard to use. But now we don't need to use protractors. So, you know, let's do some polygon thinking about and use repeats and angle measures to really get them to understand how a triangle and a square are put together. Awesome. A great example. And I wanted to mention um, Westfire's blog. It's called Moving at the Speed of Creativity. And on that blog, you will see he's got several posts about um, coding and games with kids, Hopscotch, Scratch, Minecraft. And um, he has links to his ebook there too. So if anybody's watching and wants to go check that out, Moving at the Speed of Creativity, Wes Fryer um, on Twitter also. Great guy to follow and get lots of uh, coding ideas from. Definitely. Right. And a really nice guy too. Send him a question, he responds. Awesome. Yeah, that's, I love that. Um, any other final thoughts or comments, Sam? Um, I'm just excited. You know, one of the things I keep coming back to as I'm working, looking over the shoulder of a kindergartner who's figuring out how functions work. I think, you know, it was sometime after my bachelor's that I figured that out. How will this student's world be different? Because they've got that piece of the schema built in their brain already. Yeah. Like, I know we're changing the world because we have students that can think very differently than we were able to at their age. And I'm just excited to see where that goes. Absolutely, absolutely. And I really want to encourage teachers who haven't coded to try it. The hour of code tutorials is still available. Right, give it, give it a shot. It's, it's just like playing Angry Birds. You can do it at home. No one has to know. Yes. And then you're going to say, wow, this is amazing, and my students need to do this. And I would encourage teachers, instead, if they initially think, oh, students can't do this, to really challenge themselves to approach it with, what will a student do with this? How will they solve this problem? And to give them a chance. And understand that if, if it all goes wrong and they end up confused, there's resources for that too, and that can be a productive, teachable moment. Uh, so, you know, to, to quote Refraz, uh, to, to be fierce, right? To get in there, or to quote, quote, quote Matt Gomez, be brave, yeah. and be willing to take those chances and give your students an opportunity to amaze yourself and themselves. And you will be amazed. I think everybody will. So definitely check out code.org. They have all the tutorials still there, including the paperless, uh, the paper-based ones that Sam mm -hmm. made. Uh, you don't even have to have a computer. Very easy to do. They're fun. And of course, find me on Twitter or Google+. Plus. Um, find Sam also all over the place. We'd be happy, yep. be happy to help anybody that wants. Definitely. All right. Well, thank you for coming thank today. Thank you. It was a great conversation. All right. See ya. See you later.